So anyways, so this trig identity sheet can be found both in PDF and Word format right here. And so if you want to uh, print that out, if you want to have a really uh, quick tool that's perfectly, you know, fine to print out and take with you on the test. I have some sheets for people who are in here. Uh, I'll pass those out in just a minute for people who are in here. But for all of you who are online, trick editing sheets right there. Okay. All right. And then other than that, Couple of homeworks due this week, the 7172-7374, um, due by Friday. Okay. Now basically we are done with 7-1. Any questions about trig identity sheet? I'll, again, I'll pass a couple of those out in a second. So we're done with 7-1, and as you see in chapter 7, there's not a lot of calculator work or math, math numerical work. It's more of, well, let's get a bunch of trig identities, throw in all of our algebraic tools that we know how to deal with, and then see if we can make one of these big long trick expressions simpler, or we say, is this trick expression equal to this other trick expression? Right, that's the big idea. So I'm gonna move into section seven two. And these are the sum difference and co-function identities. So let's, I'm going to start out with the sum difference identity. Sum slash difference identities. All right. So the first one says, if we have the sign of two things added together, we'll say sign of x plus y, then that can be rewritten as the sign of x multiplied times the cosine of y plus the cosine of x times the sine of y. That's a really, really weird identity, isn't it? Really crazy looking identity. And it turns out this identity comes from the unit circle. So looking at the unit circle and figuring some things out on the unit circle. Before I show you that though, so I'm gonna give a few two other identities. One for cosine. Cosine of x plus y is equal to cosine x times cosine of y minus sine of x 
times sine of y. And then lastly, the tangent of x plus y. is equal to tangent of x plus tangent of y. Divided by one minus tangent of x times tangent of y. By the way, this one, if you wanted to, you can actually create this one from a combination of those two, because tangent is sine over cosine. So you put this one over this one and then rewrite it, it turns out you get that. Does that make sense? So. so this one can be figured out by just taking this divided by this, and then it turns if you put this in the numerator, that's in the denominator. If you multiply everything by one over cosine x, cosine y on top and bottom, then you end up with this. By the way, this is called some difference identities. Some books will go through and give you a whole other identity if you do a minus here. I don't like doing that because if I put a minus here, all I have to really do is pretend that this is a minus y. Does that make sense? So if I do a subtraction here, just put a negative there, negative there, and then hopefully you remember the even odd identities that we did last time. And cosine of a negative is the same thing as cosine of a positive, sine of a negative, is the same thing as negative of sine of positive. Remember doing that? So if you apply those, you can get difference formulas too. You put minuses in there. So I won't do that. Let me show you uh, briefly where these come from. I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on where these come from, but I do wanna show you The idea, anyways. So this is one of those things where the book has a nice handy picture. So I'm gonna look that up. And this, oh, I'm sorry, I thought I was projected in here. This gives you one for differences. So this is, gives you the distance difference formula with the minus sign. As you can see, if you just do this, you start with a negative beta. And what would happen? Well, cosine of negative beta is the same thing as cosine of positive beta, so that stays the same. And then sine of negative beta, you can pull out the negative and make the minus into a plus. So, so there's no real difference there. But it's easier to see with uh, A minus B, or alpha minus beta. So if you take two angles, alpha and beta, and then take the difference, alpha minus beta. So alpha minus beta, hopefully you can see there, is going from point A to point Q. Beta is Q 
to basically one zero. And then the alpha goes from one zero all the way to P. And it turns out if you really get into that picture, The coordinates of this A, oh, I'm sorry, is that, yeah, coordinates in A are cosine of alpha minus beta, comma sine alpha minus beta, and then you can look at some triangular uh, rotational stuff. This is tough to see, I know, but you get a really messy looking distance formula when you do the distance from P to Q, P to Q, and you go through a whole mess of stuff, you get this distance formula, then you get this distance formula from A to B, and then you simplify and it's a whole hot mess, right? So all I'm saying is, <clears throat> that this comes out of the unit circle. And if you want to like, trudge through it and figure out why things are the way they are, you can do that. But it just suffices that it's something from the unit circle and it deals with the distances between various various points on the unit circle. Okay, so that's the idea. And like I said, I only give you this cosine of adding, or the uh, difference formula for the adding, the subtracting, we just apply a negative. I use X's and Y's, the book used alphas and betas. But same thing, all right? So, as you can see, we're not going to spend too long of a time doing proofs that, that is, these are, in fact, the right identities, okay? We're just going to say yes, they are. If you want to trudge through it, look through the you know look through the book and trudge through that. So that, those are the identities. And with that, what we can do is we can get what's called some co-function identities. Now, the cofunction identities I think of as shift identities. And they actually come straight from the sum difference identities over here. So let me give you an example. It turns out that if you take sine of pi over 2 minus x, you end up with the same thing as if you just have cosine of x.
Now you might say, why is that true? Well, let's apply our sum difference formulas that we just wrote down with this. So sine of pi over two minus x, sum difference formula would say, well, that's sine of the first angle times cosine of the second. plus cosine of the first times sine of the second. And I'm just making that x and minus x for sake of ease. Again, we're in radians every time we do this. And all we have to realize is that what happens with sine of pi over 2? Well, sine of pi over 2 gives me the number 1. What happens with cosine of pi over 2? Well, cosine of pi over 2 gives me a 0. Zero times anything is zero. And then here, I can apply the even odd rules that cosine of negative x is the same thing as cosine of positive x. Just to say, well, that's cosine of positive x. So now we have a cofunction identity Which is basically saying, if I take sine and shift it, negate and shift it, I end up with cosine. Which makes, should make sense um, if you think about Desmos and how we graphed these two. Oops. sine and cosine function. So if you think about the graph of sine and the graph of cosine, they're just shifted from each other. So let me do y equals sine of x, y equals cosine of x, right? They're the same waves, but just shifted over. Red there is sine and Blue there is cosine. So what are we saying? We're saying that if we take a negative x, that'll flip it across the x-axis and then add pi over two. Oops. All of a sudden, we get the same curve. And there's a lot of those that, you know, we could do. The few that, the few co-function identities that are on this trick sheet have to do with um, shifts of pi over two. Let's just write those down. If you take cosine of pi over two, minus x, you get sine Don't flip it, shift it. Notice that these are the same shifts. That's why they use this version of it. So that they're the same. Um, if you do tangent of that same thing, pi over two, minus x, it turns out you get cotangent.
And if you do cotangent of pi over 2 minus x, you get tangent. And all of those can be easily shown through the sum difference identities that we just have. Just plug in pi over 2 as your first angle, negative x as your second angle, and go through your sum difference identities in the same way I did here. And that those things will pop right out. Oh, by the way, if you're doing cotangent and you're looking for a sum difference identity for cotangent. I'm sure you probably figured this out. I need cotangent, just take the reciprocal, right? So if you're looking for a sum difference identity of cotangent of x plus y, just reciprocate that. Done. So these are the co function identities um, that. People usually give because of the connection, they're all pi over 2 minus x, right? So they're all pi over 2 minus x. And so that makes them fairly nice. So, what types of things are maybe we do? Well, let's look at some other possible co function identities. Like I said, I think of these as shift identities because they're, um, they look like they're just shifts along of our base of our uh, sine wave and cosine wave curves. So let's take another. Let's uh, determine. A function or the, an expression, a single trig expression to a trig function. That is equal to um, we'll do cosine uh, x plus pi. So determine a trig function that's equal to cosine of x plus pi. So we take our expression and we say first angle, second angle, x is our first, y is our second in this expression. Is equal to cosine of the first times cosine of the second minus sine of the first times sine of the second. And then what I would do is I would calculate what's cosine of pi. But I know what cosine of pi is without typing it in. Go for it. You typed it in. Yes. Just think unit circle, first coordinate on the unit circle of pi is going to be negative one. 
So negative one times cosine of x minus sine of x and then sine of pi is zero. So what's the trig function? Well, cosine of x plus pi is actually negative cosine of x. So if you shift cosine over by pi units, get negative cosine. How about this? I want you to try these. Let's do sine of x. We'll do minus pi over 2. One of our co-function identities is pi over 2 minus x. So let's do x minus pi over 2. And then also try tangent of x minus pi. Apply the sub difference identities and see what type of trig function you get. Or trig expression or By the way, the printed out versions of the ones I just gave out in class originally had the wrong denominator. I tried to fix that. It should be a minus, right? For the tangent sum difference identity.
All right, let me go through uh, both of these. So sine of x minus power two. We do sine of x times cosine of negative power two plus cosine of x times sine of negative pi over two. And it turns out with pi over two, the cosine of negative pi over two and the cosine of positive pi over two is zero. The sine of negative pi over two is a negative one. And so when all of that's calculated, you get negative of the cosine of x. So if you shift sine to the right by pi over 2, you get negative cosine of x. Let's do tangent of x minus pi over there. Tangent of x is just tangent of x. Tangent of negative pi is actually zero. Tangent of x is tangent of x. Tangent of negative pi is zero again. So notice what you're getting. You're getting tangent of x in the numerator, and the denominator is just a one. So if I shift tangent of x over by pi units, pi units to the right, you get tangent to x again. This is actually something we've seen earlier, specifically in chapter six, we said tangent has a period of pi, right? This is another way of seeing that tangent has a period of pi. Okay, you move tangent over by pi units to get back the same thing. This could have been a plus or minus pi, it doesn't matter. So yeah, tangent has period pi, and uh, you can see that. Now this brings up an interesting thing about the co-function identity that I had earlier on the board. So I'll, I'll go back to these determining a trait function. But earlier, I had this co-function identity, tangent pi over 2 minus x is equal to cotangent of x. Remember that? And this is also a, an identity on your sheet, too, the one I just handed out. If I try to show this one using the same technique as I went over here, there's going to be something that really uh, throws a wrench in everything. And that is if I, so if I try to show this using this technique, what's going to happen is that I plug in pi over two into tangent right there and right that there. And if you try to plug in tangent of pi over two, that's one of those things that does not exist. There's an asymptote at pi over two of our tangent function. So 
I have to be a little bit clever of how I do this. I need to be a little bit clever. And the way we're clever is we end up rewriting the tangent identity before we use it. Okay? So it gets rid of those tangents of x. That makes sense. So what you do is you take and you multiply both top and bottom by a cotangent. Cotangent is the reciprocal of tangent, right? For all places where it exists. So cotangent times tangent of x just becomes a one. Then you get cotangent of x times tangent of y. Then you get cotangent of x minus tangent of y. And then you can think of everything in the sines and cosines, and then apply pi over 2 minus x to that. That makes sense? And if you're thinking of it in terms of sines and cosines, cotangent of pi over 2 is 0 over 1, which is 0, and that's fine to use. Does that make sense? Tangent of pi over 2 is 1 over 0, so it's undefined. Cotangent is 0 over 1. Now, the only reason I bring that up is not to throw everybody off. It's just to realize that just like our last um, section, when you see these trig identities, just know that these are true on the domains that they exist for, right? So these are true on the proper domains. And if you have some sort of a place where something does not exist, you can kind of cleverly avoid that place, like avoiding pi over two in this case. Avoiding having to plug in tangent to pi over two. So, yes, these sum difference identities work on the domains that allow them to work. That work. Make sense? So, there's a number of ways to rewrite that tangent sum identity. And I just multiplied by cotangent of x. If you multiply it by cotangent of y as well, now that you've done that, you could have also ended up with cotangent of y plus cotangent of x divided by cotangent of x times cotangent of y minus 1. So all three of these are technically the same sum difference identity. You can use any of them. Does that work?
And that's nice for avoid, avoiding things like tangent of pi over two. Which is different. All right, let's do uh, two more of these. And this will be our last couple in, of these types. Let's do uh, secant of x plus pi, and then cosecant of x plus pi over 2. I want you to try those on your own using the sum difference I did. All right, <clears throat> so these obviously you put together what we know about secants and cosecants and how they re relate in terms of their reciprocals of sines and cosines, and then we apply the sum difference identities to that. So secant of x plus pi is one over cosine of x plus pi. Now, if we've already done this one, cosine of x plus pi is negative cosine of x. We can do that. Um, but let's assume we don't know that. If we don't know that, then we just take the cosine of x plus pi and replace it with cosine of x times cosine of pi minus sine of x times 
times sine of pi. That's just this identity. X is my first angle, pi is my second angle. Cosine of pi is negative one. Sine of pi is zero. So you get one divided by negative cosine of x, which is just negative secant of x. And again, we always have to stay on the domains that make sense. There are certain places where this would not exist. Let's do cosecant of x plus power two. It works the exact same way in terms of technique. We write one over sine of x plus pi over two. And if we knew what that was immediately from maybe some previous work, we could do that. But I'll just go through sine of x, cosine pi over two plus cosine of x times sine of pi over two. Is that right? Cosine of pi over two is zero. Sine of pi over two is a positive one. So it turns out you get one over cosine of x, which is just the positive secant of x. That work? Nothing too crazy. This is what the majority of 7 2 is. It's saying things like, well, secant of x plus pi is what? And then it's either true false, it's equal to secant of x, or it's going to be multiple choice where a, b, c, and d, and e are all just different functions. All right? And so, just like, you know, the things we're doing in step one, it's multiple choice or true false kind of identity. So that's most of it. If you shift around by pi over two, you shift by pi, what do you get? Now, so most of it's shifting. There's a couple of other observations we can make from these sum difference identities. 
The first one is this. If I have sine of 2x, that's like the sine of x plus x, right? So if I just have x and x again. What do I get here? Sine of x, cosine of x, cosine of x, sine of x. Order doesn't matter if I multiply sine x times cosine x or cosine x times sine x. Those are the same things, right? Those two. So notice that if I take sine of 2x, I get two copies of sine x times cosine of x. I want you to see what happens if you put 2x in as your argument inside of cosine, and then do the same thing with tang tangent of 2x. See what you end up with in those cases using the sum difference identity. And I will give you the basic version of this and the cotangent version of this. And then the mix and match version of that.
So let's go through cosine of 2x. So think of it as cosine of x plus x. And we get cosine of x times cosine of second angle, which is going to also be x, minus sine x times sine x. And so the cosine of 2x is actually cosine squared of x minus sine squared of x. Now, don't mess this up. Cosine squared plus sine squared is one, but cosine squared minus sine squared is not one, right, in general. So that's as simple as it can get. Don't accidentally think that's one because we have a plus only if it's, we have a one only if it's a plus. Tangent of 2x, I plug that in my formula, and on the, in the numerator, I get 2 times tangent of x divided by, in the denominator, it's 1 minus tangent squared. By the way, just like we had last time, tangent of 2x, we have this way to write it. If you multiply times a single cotangent on top and bottom, that would be eliminated, so you just get a 2 on the top. Cotangent times 1 is cotangent. Cotangent times tangent squared is just a single tangent. So that's if you multiply by cotangent on top and bottom there. And then if I, once again, multiply by cotangent, on top and bottom, I get two times cotangent divided by, if I multiply it by another cotangent, I get cotangent squared minus one in the denominator. So all of those things are the same where they exist. So on the domains that they exist, those are the same. And there's a couple that might be easier or harder depending on what angle you plug in. Are you okay with that? Same where I'm getting that, just multiply cotangent over cotangent. Uh, By the way, you know what these are called? These are actually called double angle identities. And this is what 7 3 is all about. So 7 3 gives you these new identities. But they're actually just these some difference identities with specific, uh, they're specific to having the same X and X, essentially. Does that make sense? So let's go right. Let's go right to section 7.3. Now that we've seen these identities and write them down. 7.3 is about double 
angle and half angle identities. And, oops, let me write this. The double angle ones. Are the ones we just said. Sine of two X is two times sine X cosine X. Cosine of two X is equal to cosine squared of X minus sine squared of X. And then tangent of two X is equal to any one of those three, but we'll write all three down. Two times tangent of x divided by one minus tangent squared of x. Or two divided by cotangent of x minus tangent of x. Or two times cotangent of x divided by cotangent of x squared minus one. So all three of those are generally written. As the double angle identities. And so once you know those, you can use those. And when I say use those, I mean the same types of ways that we always do. So for instance, let's say we want to simplify, and this would come either in a true false statement or a matching statement. But I'll just say simplify right now. So to simplify tangent of x times one plus cosine of 2x. And we have, well, we have a double angle identity with cosine of 2x. So we apply it. Replace cosine of 2x with that. And 
And you know what I would probably do? Anybody got any ideas at this point on what to do? Would he expand the tangent out into the sine over cosine? You could, for sure. I'm going to do one thing a little bit. Maybe the so, let me say this. This kind of shows you that there's multiple avenues to go through, right? And it shows you in chapter seven, the hard part is to sometimes see the simplest and easiest avenue. Okay. If I start multiplying through by tangent right now, you, you can absolutely do that and simplify some things. And uh, you'll probably end up getting the same thing I do in the end. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw in something. I'm going to rewrite this into one minus sine squared plus cosine squared. So I'm just going to flip the sine and cosine, and then I'm going to reorganize my brain. To focus on that part, the one minus sine squared. The reason I'm going to focus on that component is because um, if I have cosine squared plus sine squared, I get a 1, right? If I subtract sine squared from both sides, that means I have cosine squared of whatever the angle is, is one minus sine squared of whatever the angle is. So by the, the Pythagorean identity, I can replace that one minus sine squared with a cosine Square. So now I'm adding two cosine squares inside. Now I'll write sine of x divided by cosine of x times two cosine squared of x. When I multiply n, I'm going to get 2. One of the cosines cancels out with the other cosine. So I'm going to get 2. And then I'll have sine of x multiplied times cosine of x. By the way, if I really wanted to go even further, what's this? That's exactly what I have over here, isn't it? So that's sine of 2x if I wanted to go further. Hopefully you can see that, but I'm pretty low on the board. So it's stuff like that that we can uh, utilize. So 
So if I throw my double angles along with the Pythagorean identities, all that. Good to go. Does that make sense? Double angles with the Pythagorean identity. Um, there's probably going to be a couple of things with cotangent of 2x in it, where you have to say, is this thing equal to cotangent of 2x? And remember, cotangent of 2x is just reciprocal of tangent of 2x, where it's defined. And so you can use either of um, any of those three identities in reciprocal version for cotangent of 2x. That makes sense. Any of the three identities we had on the board in the reciprocal version. Let's do another something that deals with uh, double angles. And I'll do it this way. Is this an identity? Is this true or false, in other words? Okay. Let's do cosecant of 2 acts is equal to cosecant squared of x divided by 2 minus cosecant squared of x. Now, these are types where you might say, well, is this identity? Should I start working on the left-hand side or the right-hand side? Or, right? It doesn't. The answer is, I don't know. Yeah, we'll figure it out, right? Sometimes you can start working on both sides at the same time. Other times, it might be easier to work on just one side get some equivalencies and then move on to the other. Let's, uh, I think I'd like to work on both sides at the same time. So cosecant is one over sine. So cosecant of two X is one over sine of two X. I'm going to look into the future and know that that's going to involve sines and cosines. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply sine squared on the top and bottom of that fraction. Okay. You could rewrite everything, but it's just going to be easier to say, oh, cosecant of x times sine of x becomes a 1. 
So cosecant times sine, since the reciprocals are going to end up being a one on the domains that work. So cosecant squared times sine squared becomes a one. Sine squared times cosecant squared becomes a one. Sine squared times two is two sine squared. There we go. I don't know how much you guys, you uh, all like fractions. If you are very comfortable with fractions, you can leave it here. But notice the numerators are the same, they're both ones. So the only time these fractions can be equal are if the denominators are the same. So you could just say, well, let's just set the denominators equal to each other at this stage. Or, in other words, you could say, let's cross multiply. You end up with two sine squared minus one. So the denominator on the right hand side is equal to the denominator on the left hand side. That's Another version of saying, if you have the same numerators, the fractions are equal only when the denominators are equal. Um, well, shoot. Let's do this one. Sine of 2x is 2 times sine of x times cosine of x. Not look very promising, does it? For an identity. Doesn't look like it's going anywhere. And it won't. But there is another trick I might be able to use. I want to show you this one. So this is 2 sine squared minus 1. That's like doing a sine squared plus another sine squared minus one. Well, sine squared minus one is just the negative of one minus sine squared, right? So that's simply what I mean by that. This is the Pythagorean identity with negative cosine squared. Okay with that. With negative cosine squared. So I get sine squared minus cosine squared equaling two sine times cosine. And 
and you say, well, that does not look promising, and it even looks less promising when you put it this way. What's this right-hand side? This right-hand side was sine of 2x. I probably shouldn't have done this, right? The wish tells me I probably shouldn't have done that, gone through all that. But again, sometimes you don't see something. So you go through a few things, and you think, well, can I manipulate? No, no, can't do that. Better to go back here. This was just sine of 2x on the right-hand side. On the left-hand side, sine squared minus cosine squared, that's the opposite of this, right? So that's just negative cosine of 2x. Is sine of an angle always the same thing as negative cosine of an angle? No, right? That's pretty easy to say no. To. So this is not an identity. Or in other words, I can say, say it this way. I know for sure this is not equal. And so that one's not equal. And that one's not equal. And that one's not equal. And that one's not equal. Right? Once I can see that that bottom one is not equal for all x's, I know that all the rest of them up are not equal. So that is not an identity. Or you could just say false. That one has an equal sign. Yeah, sometimes you start working and you go, maybe I shouldn't have worked that in that through that avenue. You know what I mean? That's the way it goes. That's the way a lot of these go. You start, you go through down a certain path, and you might say, Well, that path kind of led me to a dead end. So let's go back and start. Again, it's sign of 2x. Or maybe I should have been working on the other side of this. Um, and that's just, again, that's the nature of chapter 7. Okay. So we're. One thing I, want, I do want to mention, though, uh, before I go through is oftentimes people want to imply certain things about these double angle identities that are not the case when you get into higher, uh, how do I want to say this? Higher numbers, okay? So for instance, Let's just observe something. If I did sum of, let's say, 4x, and I apply to here, that is not the same thing as 4 times sine x cosine x. So a lot of times people want to say, well, let's just pull out the four. We pulled out the two. Can't we pull out the four? And the answer is no. Sine of 4x is sine of 2 times 2x, which sine of double this angle is double the sine of 2x times cosine of 2x. So I can't, well, let, let me keep going on this. 
What's sine of 2x? Well, that's this. So we get double 2 sine x cosine x. And then what's cosine of 2x? Well, that is cosine squared of x minus sine squared of x. So what do you get? You get something really messy, basically, is what I'm trying to get at. Four times sine times cosine. Times cosine squared times minus sine squared. So you can see that that's not the same thing as four times sine x cosine x. That's all I'm trying to get at. So a lot of times people will try to apply the double angle to any angle. They'll put a four in here, an eight in here, you know, whatever. A lot of times, especially with powers of two, people think, oh, it's a power of two. So let's just pull out this two. Like I kind of almost pulled out the two in front, just apply the two. It doesn't work that way if the number is four. That's what I'm trying to get. It's not going to work the same way if the number is eight. I'm going to work the same way if the number is 6 or 10 or whatever. That only works for double angles. Just an observation. Now, the next part of 7.3 is the half angle identities. Half angle identities. And I'm just going to tell you where these come from. These come from right here. Putting in like one half x, one half x, and then if this is one half x, this becomes a whole x, right? So if I put in one half x here, and here, this just becomes 1x. And here's the thing, cosine squared is 1 minus sine squared, right? Sine squared is 1 minus cosine squared. So if I replace this with 1 minus sine squared of that angle, right? 
from the Pythagorean identity. What I end up with is that cosine of x is equal to 1 minus 2 times sine squared of the half angle. And I just solve for sine of the half angle. That makes sense. So solve for the half angle. And with the same way, you can do the same thing with cosine. You can replace the sine squared with 1 minus cosine squared. And then you can solve for cosine of the half angle. That makes sense? So that's what you do. I'm not going to, that's not the gist of it. Once you do this, you end up with, I should have left that on the board, sine of x over 2 is equal to plus or minus the square root of 1 minus cosine of x over 2. Again, that was what I had on the board earlier, solve for sine of x over 2. You end up with cosine of x over 2 is equal to plus or minus 1 plus cosine of x over 2. Two underneath the square root. And then for tangent of x over two. You end up with plus or minus one minus this is cosine of x divided by one plus cosine of x all underneath the square. I know you know what uh, where this comes from. This comes from just the fact that tangent is sine divided by cosine. So if you take this one divided by this one, the twos cancel out, you'll be left with one minus cosine on the top, one plus cosine on the bottom. And with the square root. Okay. We don't typically deal with a lot of half angle identities in this class. Um, these square roots do kind of, they either give it away or they make things impossible to work out, one of the two. It's either super easy or super hard. So uh, we don't deal with a whole lot of half angle identities in this class, but that's what they are. And they're all coming, these two come from this double angle identity, just written this way. And then apply the Pythagorean theorem and solve for it. And then this one is just tangent sine over cosine. So I think that's really all I want to, if you have half angle identity stuff, in the homework, then obviously you can kind of go through it. But again, square roots either make it really, really difficult or really, really easy. One of the two. Okay. Very hard to deal with. So instead of dealing with a lot of half, half angle identity stuff, we dealt a lot with double angle identity. 
I'm going to go right now to 7, 4. So, seven and four are called the product sum, sum product. I like to do product to sum. And the sum to product identities. All right, let's do the product to sum identities. We can do it in reverse too. So what this says is if you take sine of an angle times uh, let's start out with the way the book does it. So sine times cosine of a different angle. So sine of x times cosine of y. But we're trying to do a's and b's. It really doesn't matter to me. Sometimes people like the a's and b's and x and y's throw them off. I don't know. I'll, I'll use this. You can convert everything to whatever you like. What you end up getting is one half of a sum. That sum is going to be sine of x plus y plus sine of x minus y. Then you can do the cosine times another cosine. So those, that product. And then you can do a sine times another sine. That product. So we have a product and it's trans transforming into a sum of other trig functions. So that's why it's product to sum. So now, so that's sine times cosine, product to sum. Now cosine times cosine, product to sum, is one half cosine x plus y plus cosine x minus y. With the sign What happens is you get cosine of x minus y. Minus the cosine of x 
plus one. By the way, you know where these come from? They actually come from the sum difference formulas. Okay, this is uh, sine plus a sine. So I'll just do this first one, okay? Does that work? I'll do the first trace through. What if we took sine of x plus y? You don't even have to write this. I can just say the origins. R from the sum difference item. I mean, origins are from some. So let me give you an example. So I'll do this first one sine of x plus y plus the sine of x minus y. What would that be equal to with the sum difference identities? Well, sine of x plus y, go back to your sheet, the sum difference identities are sine of x cosine of y plus cosine of x times sine of y. That's just that, right? And then we do this one. That would be sine of x times cosine of negative y plus cosine of x times sine of negative y. Barely made it. Now we use the even odd features of sine and cosine. So this is sine x, cosine of y, plus cosine of x, sine y. The evenness of cosine says it'll absorb that negative, and I can write sine x times cosine of y, positive y. The oddness of sine says I can pull that minus sign out front, and get that. Well, what's going to happen? This is a positive cosine sine. This is a negative cosine sine. So that's going to cancel with that one. And now these two are the same. So I end up by getting just two sine x cosine y is equal to that. I divide both sides by two, what do I get? I divide both those sides by two, I get sine x times cosine y equals one half times this, which is exactly what this identity is. We follow that. So in other words, If 
divide both sides by two, and you get your product the sum identity that we have that first one. And you can go through each of these in the same way. If I do a sum difference identity on cosine plus cosine, if I do a sum difference identity on cosine minus cosine, it turns out you get double this, double that, right? But by two, you get the guys. So the product of sum identities are essentially just results of the sum difference identities. Okay, so that's where they're coming from. But it's nice to have because now that we have that, If we wanted to rewrite something like sine, well, let me just do a five. I'm making up numbers here. Times sine of 18. And I wanted to write it as a sum difference. I'd say, well, that's sine times sine. So that's going to be one half cosine. Okay, you got to be a little bit careful on how you write the orders of things and. I'm saying the X is the five and the Y is the 18. So I do five minus 18. That's a negative 13 minus cosine of five plus 18. That's a 23. Okay. You could, if you wanted to, use the evenness of cosine to call that cosine of positive 13 if you wanted to. But there you go. Now that's just a rewrite with numbers. Obviously, you could rewrite that with. Um, variables and exponents and things of that nature too. So if you had cosine of let's say 8x times cosine of 2x, how would you rewrite that? I want you to try that on your own. So I just put in numbers in the first one, but now we have variables in the second one. Hopefully these are not too crazy. First angle, instead of just an X, is going to be an 8X. Second angle is going to be a Y to 2X. This product is some identity. And so I do one half cosine, add them up. And if I add them up, 8x and 2x added 10x. And then we do cosine 
of subtraction. Uh, 8x minus 2x is a 6x. And you're done. That's the whole thing. Questions about that? That that technique hopefully is not too awfully crazy. By the way, note that because these came from some different identities, a lot of the other identities can be pulled out from here. Okay. So, for instance, what if we wanted to rewrite um, one of those two? Okay, so let's rewrite sine x times another sine x. This way. You can say, well, that's one half cosine of x minus x be zero, right? Cosine of zero. I subtracted them. Minus cosine of x plus x. If I add them, you get two x. Now, you just rewrite this. What's cosine of zero? <clears throat> cosine of zero is one, right? Type that on your calculator, cosine of zero. One, or you'd say at angle zero or point one zero on the unit circle, cosine is the first coordinate, so it's one. So what we end up with is that sine squared of x is equal to one half one. Okay, this so far. Multiply both sides by two. I'm going to add cosine of two x to both sides. And then I'm going to subtract two. Notice that's a double angle formula for cosine. Now, is that the same double angle formula we had? Not exactly, but it's equivalent to. Okay. So, this is a double angle formula for cosine. And if you wanted to get back, to the one we have, what you do
is you replace sine squared with the Pythagorean identity one minus cosine squared. And then if I simplify that right hand side, This is one minus two, so you get a negative one. I'm gonna put that on the back side. And then I'm gonna get a negative two times negative cosine squared. That's gonna be a positive two times cosine squared minus one. This is the one we have. This that was the one we wrote down, right? Cosine of two x is equal to two cosine squared minus one. And now you can see, well, there's actually two double angle formulas for cosine. We can use that one. We can use that one. And on that trig identity sheet, both of these are there. So. What I wrote down on the board earlier, I think I only wrote down this one. Or, no, I didn't write down that one, did I? Wrote down the, um, shoot. Wrote down the sine squared minus cosine, the subtraction, cosine squared minus sine squared, right? So you see how this one comes from, these two are equivalent. They're new cosine double angle identities. And you know how we got our original double angle identity? Doesn't matter which one of these we do, but we just take one copy of the Pythagorean identity. We say, well, this one, I probably won't be able to write a whole lot of it, but. Doesn't matter which, <laughs> we say take, sorry, I forgot which one I wrote down originally. Cosine of 2x is 1 minus 2 sine squared, so take this one, and rewrite that as 1 minus sine squared of x minus another copy of sine squared of x. And then this is cosine squared of x. And that's the double angle identity that we had. I originally wrote, I forgot what, I'd forgotten which one I wrote there. But they're all equivalent, right? They're all equivalent. So you can use this one or this one, or this one, for your double angle identity. And all of those are written on this sheet, okay? All those are written on that uh, trig identity sheet under the double angle sum. I didn't write all the double angles originally on the board because I wanted to go through this. Clear as day, right? The clearest month, one or two. Okay, so that's your product of sub identities. Now, and we can rewrite things and we can do all kinds of fun stuff there. Now I want us to look at the reverse. We're gonna go from the sum to the product identities. And basically what you do is you treat each x plus y as some new letter, we'll call it z for instance. And then x minus y, I'll treat you some new letter, let's call it w, for instance. So basically, you let x 
plus y equals c and x minus y equal w. And then when you add those two things up and divide by two, you get x. And then when you subtract those things and divide by two, you get a y. And so if you rewrite this, exchanging the z and w every time you see an x plus y and an x minus y, and then you multiply both sides by two, you're going to get some to product identity. In other words, it's the reverse of this. So let me explain what those things are. Let me rewrite. <clears throat> now, I don't use Z and W, but that's, I'm trying to give you the motivation of where they're coming from. So I'm gonna use X and Y again, but it's essentially the same thing. Sine of X plus sine of Y is equal to two, times the sine of x plus y over two times cosine of x minus y over two. We follow that. If I say sine of x minus sine of y I get two times the cosine of x plus y over 2 multiplied times sine of x minus y over 2. By the way, you can use the evenness and the oddness of sine to make these the same thing. Just pull in a negative inside of the sine, make that a plus, right? I get uh, so those are the same through evenness and oddness, basically, of sign, the oddness of sign. Cosine of x plus cosine of y is equal to two times the cosine of x plus y over two times cosine of x minus y over two. And then when we subtract two cosines, Cosine of x minus cosine of y gotta make sure I got this one right. Yeah. Oh, I did write that down. So you get negative two sine 
of x plus y over 2 times another sine of x minus y over 2. Okay, okay, those. You guys get where I'm saying that these are coming from the sum of the product, product to sum are really the same thing here. I don't know if you guys caught up my argument over there or not, but let me go through a whole <clears throat> of where these things are coming from. So earlier we said if you take sine of an angle times cosine of a different angle, you get one half sine x plus y plus sine x minus y. Okay. Let z equals be equal x plus y and w equal x minus y. Then if you take z plus w over 2, add x plus y plus x minus y, the y's are going to drop out and you're just going to get two x's. So dividing by 2, you just get a single x, right? And if you subtract z minus, excuse me, Z minus W over two. You just get Y. So our rule now says that sign of z plus w over 2 times cosine of z minus w over 2 is equal to 1 half sine of x plus y with sine of z. Sine of x minus y with sine of w. And now if we multiply both sides by 2, we get 2 times the sine of z plus w divided by 2 times cosine of z minus w over 2 is equal to sine of z plus sine of w. And that is exactly what our sum to product rule is, or sum to product identity is.
And if you do this exact same thing for all your product to sum identities, you get all of your sum to product identities. If they follow that. So now we have this exact same identity we have over here, the top one, just with different letters, obviously. We can change, the letters don't mean anything. You can change the letters around and play with those and mess with those, do anything we really want. Any questions about these things? Now, with both the product to sum and sum to product, um, again, these are coming from our sum difference identities, right? They come, so all of this came out of our sum difference. So once you do that big long, Thing with unit circle. That's why I wanted to at least show you it once through the book. Once you do that big long thing with unit circle and look at these distances and you track the distances, I showed you it in the book. I didn't, I didn't write it down the book. This is a long, long process. Once you do that once, then you get all of these other identities. Okay. And all of these other identities open up lots and lots of possibilities. Now, at this point, you can actually try all of the homework from 7.1 through 7.4. You should be able to do it. Some of the stuff in 7.4, you know, it's just throwing in the sub product identity, throwing in the product to sum identity, and seeing where it leads you. All right? Sometimes that might be a dead end. Go back and start over. But uh, in general, you just try to pick the identity in which looks like it's going to work the best. Kind of go through and chug through it. Just try to see. Usually, if you get an equal sign, is it a true false? Or if you got an equal, I mean, or if it's a uh, an expression, it's like, can you simplify it to a simpler expression? And it's multiple choice. So I want you to try that again. You can do, should be able to do all the homework from 7 1 to 7 4. Um, but not going to say it's super duper easy. Sometimes you got to go through a couple of you know, paths before you get to the right, uh, right solution. You know, you might end up with a couple of dead ends. That's the way it goes. Okay. All right. Well, I'll see you next time. Then.